Okay, it's on. <laughs> Just check. Oh, my. Andy, here's a lapel mic. Well, once again, good morning. It is good to see everyone this morning. We've had a few more to come in uh, in the back there. We've got uh, Arlene and Alejandra who pre-registered. They're here with us now. Uh, glad to see them. Uh, we've got the Frost girls back there in the back. Glad to see them. Uh, so, uh, and then everybody, Bob Norman's here. Good to see Bob. He's like, yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Steve. Uh, <laughs> So uh, we are we are excited to uh, be here. This this is the 24th year of this event that started in 2000. Uh, we did miss two years. Uh, something happened about 2020, so we missed 2020. We missed 2021, uh, but we came back in 2022. So this is the actual 22nd uh, event that's been held. But it, but we started it 24 years ago, and uh, we we are. Uh, Always uh, look forward to this weekend. Um, it gives the singles a lot of things to do. They they are very involved in the planning. They pick the theme, and we work out the individual lessons, and and then uh, the the big decisions are on decorations. You would not believe the discussions that we had about decorations in the fellowship room, and uh, they looked wonderful, didn't they? Yes, they looked wonderful. No, they did. They looked great. So. Um, but we're, uh, we're glad to have you here. Um, our format is going to be we're going to have a song, and, and this year the songs are pre-selected. We don't have to go through all that because each uh, speaker is speaking on a certain song, and we're going to sing that song to help them remember what they're going to talk about. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so our, our first song this morning, uh, Brother Steve Grubb, uh, who is in his uh, more or less Tennessee orange, as usual. He's going to lead our, our first song this morning. Um, and um, let's see, I'd like to get somebody for an opening prayer. Who can move real fast? Alan Pitchford. Alan Pitchford, who is our youth involvement minister, well, all the way in the back, but he's got real long legs, so he can move fast. So we'll get Alan to... Uh, 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 yeah. Uh, yes, this is the Church of God. We're speaking in tongues. No, we're not. Uh, <laughs> we'll get Alan to come up and, and offer our, uh, our uh, prayer. And uh, then I will introduce, like he needs an introduction, I'll introduce our first speaker uh, at the appropriate time. So, Steve, if you'll come lead us. Good morning. I think Steve said the uh, song will be on the overhead for you there, but it is. this is my father's world. If you want to use your book, you may do so at 929. This is my father's world, and to my
We had a, a lady that had registered to be with us this weekend. Uh, her name is Barbara, and uh, she's a very good friend of Dana Bowman, one of our members. And Barbara has ended up in the hospital, and uh, she is uh, not in really good shape at the moment. Uh, and hopefully things will turn around in her favor. Uh, and and what is Barbara's last name again? I'm Garcia. That's what I that's what I was thinking, but I didn't want to say it without being sure. So if you can remember Barbara Garcia in the prayer round. Let's bow together. Father, we come before you this morning. We're just so grateful to have you as our God, and we are just in awe of your creation, as we've just sung about the the way that your creation declares your name and your glory throughout all the earth. Lord, we see that as we live every day, as we have our eyes open to your your splendor all around us. We're just amazed at how great you are. And Lord, we thank you that you, as great as you are, that you look down on us with favor, that you hear our prayers, that you care about us, that you welcome us into your family. And we thank you for the group that's gathered here this weekend. We thank you for their just for their faithfulness, for their desire to be around other believers and to be able to praise you together and to be able to open the word together. And we just pray that you'll bless each one that's gathered here. We thank you for their safety and getting here. And we thank you for just the, the health that everyone has to be able to be here together even today. And Father, we are mindful of Barbara, who is not able to be with us. And we pray that you'll Bless her and be with those that are caring for her as well. And Father, we just pray that you'll um, give her comfort and strength and help her to have uh, a quick recovery from the problems that she's facing. Lord, we are mindful of so many others as well. We know we all have probably a whole list of those that are on our minds and our hearts that are struggling in different ways, whether that's with health-related issues, whether that's with just times of grief that they're facing in their life, or whether that's with deeper personal struggles um, of various kinds. And Lord, we know that there's always, there's always challenges all around us, and we know that so many are hurting in different ways that we might not even be aware of. We just pray that you'll be with each one and continue to be with us. Help build us up and strengthen us even through our time together this morning. We thank you for Andy. We thank you for his, um, just for his passion and ministry and the work that he's doing at Rossville and his uh, willingness to, to prepare these messages today to share with the group here. And we just pray that you'll bless him as he brings the word to us and help us all to have open hearts as we open the word together and consider the truth that, that speaks to each one of us even today. We thank you most of all for Jesus. We thank you for the love that you've shown us through him and sending him to this earth to live among us, to set the example that he set, also to show the love that he showed and to make the sacrifice that he made. And we thank you for the invitation that we have through him to be your people. And we, help, we pray that you'll help us to, to be those people you call us to be. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first speaker this morning is a young man that grew up here at East Ridge. So we've known him a long, long time. Uh, he is uh, Andy Baumberger. His father, Paul, is with us this morning. He's one of our uh, single group members. Uh, he is the son of Paul and the late Candy Baumberger. And uh, Andy is a fine young man. Uh, he is a uh, graduate of Fried Hardeman University. Uh, he uh, spent a couple of years up in Cape Cod, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, preaching the gospel there at the Cape Cod Church of Christ. Uh, and uh, moved back uh, to his home area about two years ago. Uh, and he is uh, one of the ministers now at the Rossville Church of Christ. And so we are uh, extremely proud of this young man. And we look very forward to your lesson this morning, Andy. Come speak to us, brother. Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. It's good to be here. It's, um, it's really encouraging just to see familiar faces and also people that I don't know as well. It's just a blessing that um, this group would, would be here on a, on a Saturday morning and, and want to learn about God's Word and be together. It's, it's such a blessing. 
what do we what do we see when we see the world when we look around at the world uh, today what do we what do we see it depends on what we're we're looking for I think it would be very easy if we looked around us uh, in our own lives or on the news to see a world of brokenness to see a world of despair of sin of chaos we can look at the world around us and easily see so many things that would make it seem like that Satan is in control of the world. And there is a sense in which we know that this, this is true. We know that Scripture tells us that there is a sense in which Satan is the, the God of this world. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Jesus refers to Satan as the ruler of this world. And certainly it's true that Satan is powerful. He's at work in the world. But we know as we read about in the Word and as we just sung about that he is not the ultimate ruler of the world. God is the King. You might remember that Jesus says before he goes to the cross in John 16, I have overcome the world. And Jesus triumphs over Satan in the cross and in the resurrection, Satan only has power over the people in the world that give him power in their lives, that serve him as their father. But we as God's people know if we're, if we're in Christ, if we've been baptized into Christ, if we trust in Christ, that our father is the true king, the true creator, the true ruler. And so that th- though we see much sin and brokenness and evil in the world, the world around us is is crying out with a message telling us who our Father is. Telling us the truth that God is in charge, that God is our Creator, that this is indeed my Father's world. As the song says that we sung a moment ago, God reigns, let earth be glad. To focus our our thoughts on this idea of this being our, our Father's world, as we think about this this great song. I want us to look at a passage of Scripture that I thought of immediately when I was thinking about this song. I think that teaches us really who the worlds belong to and what that, what that should mean for us in our response to that. If you want to go ahead and turn to Psalm 19. Psalm 19 might be a familiar one to many of us. I want to start reading together Psalm 19, starting in verse 1. Psalmist writes this. The heavens declare... The glory of God. And the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes throughout all the earth. And their words to the end of the world. In them He has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. It's risings from the end of the heavens, it's circuits to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden. There is nothing hidden from its heat. When we read that, do you see what's, what's being said there by the psalmist? The created world all around us is crying out to us with a message. It's telling us something, it's speaking something to us. Every day, all around us, The skies, the mountains, the trees, the sunsets, the oceans, the rivers, all are communicating something to us. God reveals Himself through the world that He has made. The heavens are proclaiming something. They're preaching to us. The skies are saying something to us about God. This this is a reminder of what we know that the creation around us is not random. It's not arbitrary. It was designed for a purpose. It was designed to tell us something, to point to a creator. The heavens declare God's glory. And if we have eyes to see, if we're really looking, we will see that message. We will understand that message. When we we look up, we ought not just to see the skies above or the stars. We ought to see glory and evidence of a glorious, loving God who made us, that has abundantly blessed us with divine beauty. 
Have you ever just stopped and pondered when you, when you see the beauty of a, of a sunset or the glory of the night sky when you can see all the stars? Have you ever just stopped and, and pondered and been in awe of, of the creativity, of the design, of the artistry of God? We live in a world of technology and efficiency and mechanical things. And in such a world, do we ever just sit and ponder and consider what our God has made? And do we ever think about that God did not just create with pure efficiency like we might think of it? He didn't just create what was absolutely necessary for life. He created what was necessary for life and also made such beauty in the world. Such goodness in the world. He created a world that is massive and creative and awe-inspiring and beyond our comprehension. He created a world that reflects His beauty and generosity. And when I think about this, this is really the way that our Lord Jesus saw the world also. When Jesus thought about the birds of the air or He looked at the flowers of the field, what did He see? Did he just see birds of the air or flowers of the field? Or did he see something more? He looked at those things and he saw a truth there about God's care for his world. God's care for creation. His abundant provision. His sovereign hand over all things. Jesus saw the world as belonging to his Father. And he saw all around us the creation pointing us to God. The tragedy in the world, that, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, is that we, we all see this. We see this evidence for this God and we can know things about God because of the world around us. We can know things about His divine nature and about His power. And yet, what, what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 is that we as humans, what we do is we choose to reject that message. And not just reject it, Paul says that we suppress that. And rather than worship the Creator, we worship creatures. It doesn't take someone brilliant to look around and see evidence of an awesome God. Think about all the things that He has made. The order, the design, the power. As the psalmist says, this message is being proclaimed day to day, Night to night. You would think that we would, we would get that message over and over, day after day, but we sometimes stop being awed by God's world, by His beauty, by His grandeur. We often don't stop to ponder and thank Him for the amazing things that happen in this world every day. The sun comes up every day. There's breath in my lungs every day. There's beautiful creatures in the world. God made cows so that we could have ice cream. I mean, that's, that's amazing that God would, would do that. You think about all the things that God has made. And we sometimes so often take it for granted, the gifts that He's given us. And all these things that He has made, they're about God. He made them for a purpose. There's a quote from... Uh, a writer, G.K. Chesterton, that is uh, striking to me um, that I think about when I think about how we so often take for granted what God has made. I want you to listen to what he says. He says, Because children have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that make all the daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite for infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we. 
I love that quote because it, it points us to God's delight in what He has made in His own creation. And that I think he means for us to be amazed every day by him. This is what the psalmist is reminding us of. What if we had a childlike heart in response to the sun coming up every morning that God did it again. He did it again day after day. My father in heaven did that. Isn't that amazing? And he, he made that sun with the with the with the breath of his mouth, with, the, with a word, with the flicking of his finger. And he sustains the stars and galaxies day after day. The sun rising is this picture, the psalmist says, of, of joy like a bridegroom leaving his chamber or a, a strong man running his course with joy. We are, reminding, we are reminded of the blazing joy of God every day. We're reminded of his love Every day. And again, Jesus, if we we think about some of the things that Jesus said, He sees the world in this way. And He sees the Son, just as the psalmist did, He sees the Son as teaching us something about God. Remember in, in the Sermon on the Mount when He's teaching about loving our enemies, what does He do? He points to the Son. He says, the Father who is in heaven makes His Son rise on the evil and rise on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. When teaching on loving our enemies like our Father, Jesus points to the creation and ultimately He points to the Father who is over creation and says, consider how God runs the world. Consider what He has made and what that should mean to us. Consider how... He blesses the good and bad with sunshine. No one deserves that. We don't deserve just for the sun to come up every morning, with, every day with joy like a bridegroom. And yet in our Father's world, God makes the sun rise and give us sunshine, even on the unjust, even though we don't deserve it. Truly, this is my Father's world. And not a person alive is not aware of that fact deep down somewhere. We all know it. The words of the proclamation of the skies above go to the end of the world, it says. We can all know something about God by seeing the world. And again, as Romans 1 teaches us, we have, we have no excuse to reject God. Because the message is so clear, it's so evident. But just... Seeing God displayed in creation doesn't make God our Father. We can't know that this is my Father's world. We can't sing the words of that song until something else happens. You can't know God as Father just by looking at the world. We come to know and love God as our Father through His Son and through His Word. And I think the creation and the world around us that we see, it should drive us to the Word of God. Some people say, I think especially it's becoming more popular in our culture, some people say, well, just enjoying enjoying nature, enjoying the creation, that's the way that I come to know God. That's the way that I worship God. And certainly we should give thanks to God for what He has made. But really, time in God's world should drive us to have this deep desire to know more of the God who made the world. Not just know more about Him, not just understand more information about Him, but to really know Him, to really love Him, to relate to Him as He wants us to. And not only to know that, but to know that He wants me to to know a way to live in the world. And He wants me to know things about Him and how to live in His wisdom. I think the psalmist in Psalm 19 thinks in the same way because you notice there from verse 6 to verse 7, he shifts from talking about the world of God, he shifts from talking about the creation that God has made and the message that it gives, he shifts from that to talking about the Word of God. Look at what he says in verse 7 of Psalm 19. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. 
The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant from, also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So in this passage, you see the psalmist extolling the beauty and greatness, not only of the, God, the word of God, but also the word of God. You notice the way he talks about that there. He says, the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord. All these things are referring to God's word, the things that he has revealed to us. So you see how this works together in the psalm. We should look at creation. We should be in awe. We should be thankful. We should look at the world and learn something about God. But no one gets saved by looking at the sky above. No one knows how to live their life by just looking at creation. The world of God and the Word of God work together. The world drives me to want to know the God of the Word. And the Word helps me to see and understand the world that God has made in a completely different way. It helps me to know how to see the world, how to engage the world through a a God-centered lens, a Christ-centered lens. And it teaches me how I can be in right relationship with the amazing God and Father who made all that He has made. The psalmist gives us descriptions of the greatness of God's Word. Why, why is it so important? Why is, why is it so great? He says it's perfect, it's sure, it's right, it's pure, it's true. And what the Word can do in us is also amazing. It revives the soul, verse 7. It makes simple people wise, verse 7. It rejoices the heart and enlightens the eyes, verse 8. That means it helps us to understand and and see what our lives are really about, but it also gives us great joy. There is great joy found in God's Word. It impacts the whole person. It, It teaches us things that we need to know. It impacts our heads, but it also impacts our hearts, impacts our souls, impacts our very beings, so that we come to know God and love God with everything that we are. We need the Lord's direction from His Word so desperately because we live in a world of such suffering and pain and sin. Indeed, there is much beauty in creation, but there is also much ugliness because of sin and death in the world. And and like we talked about before, it feels so often like the world is in the grips of the powers of evil, in the grips of Satan. There's so much wrong going on, and so sometimes we feel helpless about that. We need direction. We need wisdom. We need the the reviving of the soul. We need joy. We need to see the world with all its pain, with all its suffering. We need to see with God's perspective, to see what He sees. Without the Word of God, we would sink into despair. We would not know or see that God has a plan for all this. He has a plan for His world. God is working in all of this. God is trustworthy and sure. That's why David says what he says in verse 10, that the precepts and word of God are more to be desired than gold and sweeter than honey. God's truth is precious. There's nothing greater than that. They warn us, they promise us great reward. Do we have this heart and this desire to know God and to know His will for our lives? And do we really believe that this book that we have, that we've been given as a gift from God, that it's more precious than anything else? Do we treat the Word of God in a way practically that it really looks like we believe that? Do we really treat it as precious? 
And one of the most precious things that the Word of God teaches us is that we can be children of God through Jesus Christ. This God who made the whole universe and everything in it, He made the galaxies far away, He made the small molecules that we can't even see, He made every bug and every mountain. That same God wants to be our Father and adopt us through Jesus into His family, and give us His own Holy Spirit. He wants that so much that He he sent His own Son to die for us, to be risen from the grave. And we have this Spirit in our hearts that Paul tells us bears witness within our spirit that we are children of God if we are in Christ, if we've been baptized into Christ. We wouldn't have access to that knowledge without the Word. We wouldn't know that without the revelation of Himself through the Word of God. And it's that truth that allows us to see the world around us entirely in an entirely different way and allows us to face that world of such brokenness with hope and confidence. If I know that God is my Father, that changes the way I see things. That enlightens my eyes. It revives my soul. It makes us wise so that we can truly know that this is my Father's world, even when there are times when it doesn't seem like that. God is the ruler yet. He is in control. Whatever happens, even if, even if the mountains are thrown into the heart of the sea and my world is turned upside down, I know that the world still belongs to my Father. It's in His hands. He has a good plan. I know not just that there is a God who designs and order th- orders things and put things into motion at the beginning, but He is my God. He is my Father who loves me. And, that, and that, that's not just an abstract idea. That, that, would make, that will make me live differently. That makes me see the sufferings of my life and of the world differently. It's as the song says, Why, why should my heart be sad? Again, it reminds me of the words of Jesus. Do not be anxious about your life. Why? Because this world belongs to my Father. Because God takes care of even the minute details of the world. He he sees the birds. He sees the, the sparrows that fall to the ground. The birds, the lilies, and yet our Father in heaven cares infinitely more for us. He knows what we need. So how much more should we trust in that Father? We can try to control the world. That doesn't go too well for me when I've tried it. We can try to be in control, but that it really never works. Much better it is to know that this is my Father's world. Do we see the world around us like Jesus saw it? When we hear the birds and raising their carols and we see the lily white, do we see what is really there? Do we see the reality spoken by these things? Do we see a maker and a father worthy of praise? Do we see a beautiful God who has a purpose in all things, in creation and in my life also? We should because He is shining in all that's fair, all that's Good and true in the world reflects the shining love of God. So this is is all great information. This is all things that we should know, that we should should take to heart. But practically, what what does this mean for our lives? What, What should we take away from this truth that this is my Father's world? I think that what I want for us all, I want for myself, is for us to have eyes that are more open to what is really there. So when we look up and we ponder the beauty of a sunset or the stars of the sky or the setting of the sun, that we wouldn't just see stars, we wouldn't just see the sky, we wouldn't just see a bird, that we would see what is really there. We would see beyond that and see what's really going on. That when we see a bird, we see the wisdom and provision of God. And we know we don't have to be anxious. And I know that from the world and from the Word that I can be free from anxiety to seek the kingdom of God first in my life. 
or when I encounter someone in my life who feels like an enemy or who dislikes me, and I'm tempted to be angry at that person, I remember that God shines the sun on them, on the just and the unjust. And I learn something about how I should relate to that person as I think about the way that God generously runs the world. By looking at the world, but also by looking at the Word of God and knowing who my Father in heaven is and knowing how He's treated me with mercy. Basically, what I'm saying is that we allow God's revelation of Himself through His creation and through the Scriptures that we let that open our eyes and interact with the world in a different way. I, I can so easily walk through life living on default mode. I can walk through life not giving much thought to the things or people that are around me. And I can, I can stay in my own little world so easily. Or I can see the world as bigger than myself. I can see the world as belonging to my Father in heaven. A father who has a purpose that's about him and about his kingdom. And so when I look at the news tomorrow, I I could see that with eyes that say, well, the world's just going to the dumps. And I can walk around being discouraged, thinking everything is getting worse and worse. Politics are bad. The economy is bad. It's all terrible. Satan's in control. Or this leader is in control or whatever it is. And I, can, I, can, I could let that make me angry or resentful. I can start to blame. I can start to be bitter. Or I can say, this is my Father's world. Even in the suffering, even in the pain, God is the ruler yet. He will provide. He will work things for good for those who love Him. He can re- bring a redeeming purpose for all of this. And even the people that I think are ruining everything, whoever it is, they are people loved by God, also created for a purpose. And He wants to be their Father too. And He's trying to teach them something too by shining the sun and by giving them air to breathe and food to eat and providing for them. And that reality, that view of the world with our Father God being in control, that totally shifts my perspective from one of despair or bitterness to one of hope and trust and love. One that thinks, how can I love like my Father loves? How can I be a part of what my Father is doing through His people, through His kingdom in the world to change the world, to bring redemption to the world? Knowing that this is our Father's world should strengthen us, but it also should humble us. When I see the world as belonging to the Father, and when I recognize that every star and every atom, every ocean and sea creature and mountain and person is revealing God and His glory, when I recognize that it's about Him and about, not about me, what I think I need or what I think I want in my life or what I think I'm entitled to becomes pretty insignificant. And the world stops being about me and what I think should happen, the way I think it should go. And really, that's a a quite freeing thing. I stop letting every little thing get to me because I recognize the world is a lot bigger than me. There are galaxies and black holes and planets and asteroids that are billions of miles away that I'm never going to see, that NASA's never going to see, And yet God is in total control of those things. No human eye will see all the glories that God has made in this lifetime. That's humbling. That's freeing. To know I can do so little to control the things in the world, but I know the one who can. I know the God of the universe who is my Father through Jesus. And I can trust Him and His plan. And when I see that my Father is sovereign and in control, that leads me to focus on the things that I can control. The things that are in my control with His help and with His strength and grace. I focus on what God wants me to be in His world. I think that's what the psalmist does at the end of Psalm 19, 13, and 14. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. 
then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In light of seeing the God of this world who made everything, in light of seeing His perfect law, His perfect word, what should my response be in my life? I think we see it here. David says, Lord, help me. Keep me from sin. Don't let sin rule in my life. You be the rule in my life. I want to be blameless. And then verse 14, let my words and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Let my heart and my life be what you want it to be. I want you to see the logic of this psalm. If the heavens above are speaking something, they're speaking a message of God that is true and right. And the word of God in the scriptures is speaking a message about God that is true and right, then we should want our hearts and our lives to speak a message about the Word of God that is true and right. Just as the heavens proclaim the handiwork of God, so should I. I should point people to this God and Father. If all of creation is about revealing God, then that is what I was made for too. My life, my mouth, my heart is about showing who God is. And I need God's help to do that. I need help from my rock and my redeemer, the one that I know on this personal level. I want my heart and the words of my mouth to be consistent with what God reveals all around us, but also in His Word. And I don't want to do anything that's going to hinder people from seeing God, that's going to obscure that vision of who God really is. I want my life and my words to reflect that I truly know and believe that this world belongs to my Father, that He is trustworthy. And I know how to reflect and live this kind of life most fully when I see Jesus, the one who is the Word, who created all things but also entered into creation to show us how to live, to show us how to live in full submission to the Father who gave His life to overcome the world and triumph over sin and death by trusting in the Father's promise. He believed that the world belonged to His Father, even when that belief and trust led Him to death. But He knew that His Father had the power to raise Him from the dead, that Satan could not conquer Him, that death could not contain Him. The Father, the Creator of all things, is far more powerful. And the cross is the moment when Satan looked like he was most in control. The cross looked like the moment where it could be questioned whether God really had a plan. That sun that the psalmist talked about that rises every day, that sun went dark for a few hours. And many people likely wondered, is God really trustworthy? Is He really there? But it's in that moment that God was working the victory. He had a plan for hope. You remember some of Jesus' last words on the cross? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Even in his death, Jesus trusted his Father. He knew his Father was in control. He knew he had a hope on the other side of the cross. God made the tree that would become the cross. He made the materials and the metals that would be formed into the nails that nailed Jesus to the cross. And he wasn't caught off guard by any of that. He had a plan for it all. Do we trust that God is in charge and the ruler, even in our suffering, even in the evil of the world? If we see the cross, we should. If we see the cross and the resurrection, we can know that God is our Father and He gave His Son to die for us. And we can be reminded that this is my Father's world. Thank you, Andy. That was a wonderful lesson. If your daddy had a vest on, the buttons would be popping right off of it right now. A great reminder that, you know, we, it is so easy, so easy for us to let the minutia of day-to-day life cloud our vision from what we really need to be thinking about, focusing on, and seeing in our Father's world. Thank you very much, Andy.
great job. We're off to a great start. We're going to take a short break. Uh, this is probably the most important announcement of the day. The restrooms are located. Uh, ladies' restrooms are on each end of the building. Uh, go down to the next hallway from the foyer. On either side, there's ladies' restrooms there. Gentlemen, there is only one large men's room down on the south end of the building. We do have a courtyard full of bushes out there, but uh, we recommend the restrooms. Uh, so... Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll take a, a quick break and then we'll uh, reassemble and, and start at 11.15 with our next lecture.